I think the most concerning thing are the austerity policies, which uh, usually come uh, with uh, most of the debt uh, uh, or the money that is lended to the continent. And this comes with cuts in essential services uh, like social protection, food or energy subsidies. And these actually affect women disproportionately and they push them behind um, some of the really aggravating gender inequalities that are usually faced. So I think for, for a start, things that really should be, um, the government should be actually looking out to is to make sure that there isn't a decrease in some of the social spending. So we've really seen this, um, for example, countries. We find that in Tunisia, for example, I mean, just going back even before the pandemic, um, between 20, 2011 and 2019, um, the share of funding for education in the public budget decreased from 26% to about 17%. And also the share of the health expenditures reduced from 6% to about 5% in 2019. And I think uh, this reduction in some of the public spending has a huge mm -hmm. in, impact, uh, partic particularly to women and girls, and it, it has a disproportionate um, impact as well. And I think we've really seen how having no investment in the public, in the public service um, infrastructure has devastating effects, particularly now with the issues of COVID as well. Another issue is that women tend to be concentrated, and I think you mentioned it, that um, there are more, more than men, uh, more women than men are concentrated in lower income sectors of society, um, in the informal economy. And these are really one of the low echelons when you look at the public sector, and they are really affected when austerity policies are put in place. Um, a report by Gender and Development um, Network where we, where we are partners as FemNet demonstrated that public debt and its servicing are a particular problem for the African continent in undermining the ability for governments to meet their commitments on gender equality and promotion of women's rights. So we see that when there's a lot of um, public debt, um, the cost of servicing this debt are very disproportionately borne by women. Uh, while the funds borrowed are rarely spent in ways and priorities uh, for gender equality, for women's rights, and for sectors um, that really uh, support women and girls um, on the continent. And we know that, and we, that women rely on public services and support due to some of these disadvantages and some of the structural gender inequalities. So any cut in public spending is really um, going to increase, for example, unpaid care work, reducing time for women to spend in paid work and also, um, also putting a huge burden on, 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 on the amount of work that women have to do in Egypt, for example. Uh, women are already spending an average of 30.25 hours per week on unpaid work, proving that this issue is really overlooked and sometimes it's not even considered when we are speaking about macroeconomic issues. And also we see that um, women also uh, take an extra burden of some of these tasks. So when governments do not provide, for example, daycare centers, this is subsidized by women. And we find that this state responsibility, even when governments borrow, they are not even supporting some of these basic needs, which will really um, uh, have, a, have a huge impact in terms of the dignity and conditions uh, for women as well. Um, I also think that uh, when you look at the different uh, loans, and I think now we are all talking about the SDRs, that the priorities, when governments are given flexibility of setting priorities, they're taught the sectors which are least political sensitive. Unfortunately, these are programs where, which support women and some of the marginalized groups are usually um, pushed back in terms of expenditure and they are not even considered as a priority as well. So, I think there should be more concentration on social services, on health, on education, on protection, and there should be that balance in terms of 
Yes, you are building roads. Yes, you are building um, huge infrastructure. But can you also look in terms of um, the social, the health, um, the conditions um, of, of, of the majority of citizens? And I like what Karina mentioned in terms of um, um, what the, pre the presidents, uh, in terms of, of, their open, of the opening remarks, that they really need to include civil society and civic voices in the debt re negotiations, debt reforms. But also, I think that also has a responsibility of trying to simplify um, you know, some of these conditions. Because I think by making the process super complex, which of course it is, um, also becomes very exclusionary for civic groups, for women's rights groups to be able to contribute um, into these discussions or to also present um, their priorities. So I do hope that going forward, there will be more engagement, which is really intentional to be more inclusive of the different groups, particularly civil voices, uh, women's rights groups to be uh, on the table in negotiating and in also prioritizing um, in terms of the whole, it could be debt repayment um, of, of, of some of these loans that we see on the continent as well. Um, so I think we must uh, reform the whole global financial uh, system and also end some of the dominance of these lenders in setting the rules to ensure that um, we increase more transparency if it's in borrowing. Um, you know, we, we need to have more accountability frameworks in place. And I think we started hearing a lot around these accountability frameworks, but they should be more inclusive in as we are designing them. They should just not be the preserve of, of the, the lenders who come up with these frameworks. But I think we should do it in a way which is really sustainable and a way which is all so um, inclusive. And I think um, one of the clear things is we should do gender analysis, um, impact analysis. If countries are to borrow, can they really first see what is the impact of that? And this is something which is really um, uh, practical in terms of how do we make sure that issues of women and girls are included and that um, when it comes up to restructuring or some of these conversations of debt, they are also freeing some of the money to finance um, development um, sectors and particularly also um, sectors of, for social protection, education, as well as um, health as well. So let, let me stop there for now. Hmm. I think that it's really interesting that you brought out the aspect of bringing in women, the need to bring in women to the negotiating table, to bring them into the discussions, in engaging them as well. From where you sit and your assessment um, on the global stage and, and uh, on the continent as well, to what extent has there been sufficient policy space given to assessing Africa's debt crisis from a gendered perspective? I think there's space has really been narrow. Um, and from where, from where we sit, we haven't seen a lot of engagement of civil society generally. Yes, when of course, um, for example, when the IMF, when they do the consultations, they, they do consult some civic voices, but to the extent to which even our own governments are creating space and facilitating the voice of women, uh, women's rights organizations to be able to support in terms of um, restructuring debt or in terms of um, doing a gender analysis, uh, impact assessments uh, prior to borrowing and even after implementation of a program. This space has really been non-existent or where it has been existent, it has been very minimum as well. So I think this is something that we are really calling for to say, um, as we are really starting to talk about um, engaging, having uh, participatory processes um, in the whole issues around uh, debt, I think it's important for us to be really, like I said before, really intentional in terms of um, how can some of the programs be structured in a way that they are doing gender impact assessments as well. And also just as a matter of justice to say, um, 
I mean, I, I think we, we, we can't, we, we shouldn't prioritize creditors over citizens. And I think this has been said by a colleague of ours, Oria. She, she really says when it comes to debt issues, I think the right approach is something that we should really um, be using and enforcing. And for example, um, to say the UN binding treaty on transnational corporations, this is a legally binding framework that should really be put in place, even particularly for private lenders, for corporations and for banks to be accountable to human rights. And I think this is something we should really uh, be really talking about when it comes to issues around debt policies and really evaluating them from a perspective, from a human rights uh, perspective and using those principles of the maximum available resources and the progressive realizations of human rights uh, should benefit um, the citizens and particularly uh, groups which are marginalized. Yeah. Could you just expound a little bit more on the alternative proposals that you're talking about and what alternative proposals we should be considering? Yeah, so I think when it comes to all alternative proposals, um, I think one of the first proposal is to really uh, push back uh, in terms of, um, I think we should be really cautious in terms of debt which comes with conditionalities and debt which is not going to put us into the structural adjustment programs. And this is one thing that I think we know what that means. So we should not be um, prioritizing um, sort of like when, when debt, when, when we are restructuring and having these conversations, I think we need to start prioritizing on, on public services, on ensuring that um, social protection, that we are not cutting some of the essential services. We are also considering and creating, um, creating a system that is going to support uh, the informal economy where we know the bulk of women, the bulk of young people, that's where the bulk of them are. So these are, this is something that we really need to start um, in terms of as alternatives to start structuring it in that way, which is not going to just benefit uh, private large corporations. I think um, there has been mention of issues on illicit financial flows. So how do we make sure that as we are offering alternatives, we are not perpetuating the, the outflow of, 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 of finances from the continent, but we are actually building sustainable economy, sustainable infrastructure that will allow us to be free of this debt. So those are some of the alternatives that we should be looking at, which are really centered on, on improving human dignity, on improving the livelihoods of, of women. We, we shouldn't be saying we've borrowed so much but we are still uh, in the same cycle. We, we've just perpetuated um, the poverty that we are experiencing. So I, I think as we go, we need to really um, be, this is why it's important to have our, the voices on the ground because the interest, um, the interest, um, the interest of, of um, our interest needs to, to find a voice they need to find a landing and they need to find a, a way in which um, the, the programs then are really structured to benefit us um, as women, as girls, but also as the majority of the African population, because these are the realities that we face all the time. Yeah. To read and sign the Harare Declaration, go to www.afroda.org backslash initiatives. Click on Afroda Conference on Data and Development and then read more. And finally, the outcome statement. <laughs>